Hello, Mage fans. This is Mage the Podcast. This is Adam Simpson speaking. And on tonight's episode, we're going to go into Tomes of Magic and talk about Ascension's right hand. Uh, with me today is my favorite acolyte, Terry Robinson. Acolyte? I'm at least a consort, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we'll have to check the show notes on that, get that one worked out. But in the meantime, um, before we get into what we're discussing today, uh, I think you've got some announcements for us, Terry. I do. One, shameless self-promotion. On the Storyteller Vault, I have released an image pack of 246 images that you can use in your Chronicle or your publications. Uh, it is currently priced at $12.99 or less. By the time this goes out, I may have reduced the price for it. They are largely whatever you want to do with them. You can remix them, you can modify them, you can print them, as long as you don't sell them as your own. Uh, it's out there for creators to use however they wish. It's a mixture of indoor and outdoor and creepy stuff and not so creepy stuff. I got a bunch of pictures of, of a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse and some prisons and graveyards and so on. Anyway, if you're looking for, for images, it's there. The PDF preview on Drive-Thru RPG includes a thumbnail of literally every image in the set. So there are no surprises. Number two, I'm going to be at PAX Unplugged. And I'm trying to see if there are enough Made to the Podcast fans going to do a meetup. If I can get 10 to 15 people between Made to the Podcast and some other properties, I'm going to try and run a meetup. PAX Unplugged is a gaming convention. It is held the weekend of December 5th through 8th in Philadelphia, which is where I live. And again, if we can get a bunch of people to go, I'm going to have a meetup of some sort. Finally... We are probably, at this point, one month into having a Discord server. If you would like to come chat with us, ask us questions directly, talk with other Mage the Ascension fans, bat around ideas for a chronicle, or ask rules questions, by all means, go there and talk to us. Information is going to be at magethepodcast.com. Those are my notes, Adam. Back to you! Uh, yeah, I uh, for the first time uh, this evening, I uh, stepped into the uh, Discord and looked around, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, talking to some other people in there in the future. And um, let's see, as we get into uh, Ascension's Right Hand, uh, this book was put out in 1995. It has a number 12 on the spine, and by the numbers on the spine, it could be called the last book of first edition before second edition got started with the second edition core book, but also uh, it's, it's actually debatable because Halls of the Arcanum came out uh, after Ascension's Right Hand, and it has a mage emblem on the back, but it doesn't have a number on the spine, and, and the uh, it doesn't have the purple on the cover. It, they recolored it to brown because it was part of Year of the Hunter. So long story short, Ascension's Right Hand could be considered the last book of first edition, or maybe not. It's hard to say. Now, this was written by Nikki Ria, Tia Wynn, and Satiros Bricado, who was uh, publishing back in 1995 under the name of uh, Phil Bricado. And uh, there's also some additional material uh, contributed by Jennifer Hartshorn and Bill Bridges, uh, who is uh, popular here with us. So this book covers what they call Kustos, and uh, it, it's got a few terms that I, I'm going to explain to people here. First off, I, I actually uh, found myself explaining the title to a mage fan uh, not too long ago. Ascension's right hand is a reference to the old expression right hand man, uh, your, your ally, your helper, the guy you can rely on every time. And so this is meant to be the people who are the right-hand man to those who are pursuing ascension. It's uh, the best way I can find to explain the actual title of the book. But um, this book covers the mortal tier of World of Darkness. And uh, those who are fans of World of Darkness are, of course, familiar with uh, what I call the mortal tier. And that is uh, characters like vampire hunters and uh, creature kinfolk and ghouls and acolytes for mage and uh, mediums in, in Wraith and, and other types of characters. The Romani got their own supplement for World of Darkness. They were uh, mortal tier characters. They have um, either no uh, supernatural powers or pa supernatural powers that are weaker than vampires, werewolves, and mages. And uh, when you are creating one, you normally give them uh, less uh, in abilities, less in skills. And so it it's like a less powerful tier uh, for characters in the world of darkness, and uh, Ascension's right hand is the mage entry uh, into that area. Um, now, Terry is going to talk us through the different sections of the book, and 
uh, we're going to get into the book proper, but before, I, I just really wanted to take a chance to lay out some terms because there are some terms you're going to hear a lot of in this episode, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar, it could be frustrating. So first off, Acolyte. On the cover of the book, it says, The Acolyte Sourcebook for a Mage the Ascension. Acolyte is a term that first showed up in the lexicon in the first chapter of the first edition Mage the Ascension core book. Uh, it is meant to be uh, someone who is a... Um, not an awakened mage, but who is an employee or an ally or a helper to a mage. And this term has been somewhat confusing with mage fans because, of course, normally the word acolyte means like a new recruit or a trainee or someone who's training up to be one of us. And so a lot of people think, oh, acolyte, that's like a mage in training. And actually, as a game term in Mage the Ascension, acolyte is someone who is not a mage and will probably never be a mage. Uh, that the term for that is uh, a mage in training would be a disciple, someone who is, is probably going to awaken quite soon or has already awakened and they're a mage in training. You call them a disciple. An acolyte who is more powerful, more capable, who is more ready to accompany a mage into dangerous situations and probably uh, more knowledgeable about what's really going on in the world of darkness is called a consor. Uh, so a consor is basically a, a stronger, more capable, and usually more aware acolyte. Uh, we get the term familiar in here, which uh, shouldn't need too much explanation. The, the idea of a witch is familiar is quite old in, in Western uh, culture, but uh, a familiar is a supernatural entity that lives in a physical body, usually an ordinary earth kind of animal, but sometimes something uh, very strange and unusual. It could be an imp, or it could be um, a glowing dot of light, or it could be a robot. You know, the, the list is endless, but a familiar is a supernatural being that has bonded on a very fundamental level with one particular mage, and they are uh, they are partners, and they go through the awakened life together. Uh, the final term you're going to hear in this episode a lot is kustos, which the book tells us comes from Latin and means favored servant. In Mage the Ascension, kustos is a game term, and it is meant to generally refer to acolytes and consors and sometimes even familiars. It's a catch-all term for allies, employees, helpers of mages. And now I've been talking a long time. Terry, I would like to hear about the sections in this book. The only thing I need to start with is the first line of the prelude, take one. And to love a god <laughs> and fear a flame <laughs> and to burn. So I crack this open and the opening segment is selling the drama by live, which I think is what? From Throwing Copper. So this was an album that came out in like May of 1994 and this book came out in like May of 1995. And as with most quotes and most of the items in this book, it has nothing to do with the rest of the content. So Prelude, take one. It's a story of a bunch of Kustos at a bar. Then some technocrats come in and then some marauders come through. And it's the scene where they go, where, where there's explosions and the marauders are being all maraudery where the game is like you need to treat insanity super seriously but we're only going to use it for comic relief internal consistency and then it goes and then the final line is after everything blows up is just another damn night at crossovers and that kind of sets the theme for a lot of my feelings about this book the first piece of art that we get is a woman hitting a guy in the head with a baseball bat who turns out to be a robot so uh once again this is this is primo first edition here kids we get a an introduction, which basically explains what Adam just said. Uh, the difference between the various things. We get a lexicon, get some introduction to things. We get a few definitions. And then, bam, we get chapter one, where things are defined. You get several pages of dense prose. And then we go to the mage factions and their follower section, which goes tradition by tradition explaining what the acolytes consors and familiars are for each group as well as for the technocracy the nefandi and the marauders and this section is so profoundly uninspired it was almost painful there was never a case where you were like huh i wouldn't have thought of that as a familiar celestial chorus familiar a lamb Really? Like, I could see if it were like a fire breathing war lamb or something like that but just a flat out Lamb. I, I, I really don't think they really put their back into this section. But anyway, this is fine. As I said to Adam and before the show, and I will front load this, is to me, this book is like saying, hey, we just got a new dinner table and we want to have eight place settings. 
and there's a certain amount of money you want to pay for the eight place settings and you find a set of 10 and it's a really good deal. It's like a great deal. It's way less than you thought you were going to pay for it, but it comes with two plates that are chipped and you're super mad that there's chipped plates in it, even though it's a great deal, even for just eight plates. That was my feeling of this book. If you were to just take out the sections I did not like, you have like 60 amazing pages and I would be like, shut up and take my money. But the fact that they added some of these other ones just kind of kind of makes me mad. And that was one of those sections where they just go faction by faction and tradition by tradition and explain what the consors, acolytes, and familiars are like. Also, it's very first edition technocracy where it's like, of course we kill our people immediately if they go out of line or get any idea of what's going on. Yeah, you're not going to have like super turnover then if you have things like that. Chapter two is going over what the actual jobs that acolytes, familiars, and consors do. And this is a pretty standard section. It makes sense. It goes through the various roles, how they differ from the technocracy to the traditions, to the marauders, to the nefandi. There's a section on recruitment, how they pick them up, which is kind of interesting. And then it starts getting into the, the first part of me that went, oh man, this section is meaty, where they talk about mage custos relationships. And they say, why would an acolyte or a console or a familiar put up with this. And they go through the physical rewards, like gotta get paid. You go through the mental rewards of this is the powerful psychological rewards of the loyalty of service. And then finally the magical rewards. And this was the section where you're like, oh, I get it now. Where, what would you be willing to do? Who would you be willing to serve if you found out that someone had access to magic that could prevent your cousin from dying of cancer? Or what would you do to someone who had access to mind magic that allowed you to relive the best days of your life? Or someone who had intimate access to the neurochemistry of your brain that would allow you to experience a pleasure beyond what any other human had otherwise ever experienced. And you're like, oh, this book makes sense now. Then there's a section on rogues, those who leave service and why, and a set of fellowships. These are groups of custos that have banded together to be custos together. This section was very hit or miss to me in just one example of what felt like a book that wasn't fully edited. There's a group called the Lab Rats, which is a group of technocracy custos. There is already a group called the Lab Rats. That is the cabal that Dante, the virtual adept, is a part of, and they're all progenitor uh, escapees. Then we get a in-world section on how to survive as a kustos, which isn't very good. And then we go to chapter three, which is how to play these. And it goes through a couple of options. Do you want to have a chronicle where everyone is a kustos? Do you want to do troop style play, which gives your characters the opportunity to rotate back and forth between being their character and maybe being the Chantry guards? I thought that was a super good idea. I'm a big fan of troop style play where I'll say, okay, team, before tonight's session properly starts, we're going to have 25 minutes of you being the guards to kind of set scenery and allow players to set up how the, the game is going to unfold. And that, that again, was perfectly fine. We get a little bit of recommendation on plots that are going to come out the other side of having Custos involved. This section was also pretty good and probably means that Adam's not going to have a lot of story hook ideas because we get pretty well an entire chapter on them. And, uh, and, and those I thought were pretty creative and pretty impressive, uh, whether it be we need to go collect the guy that was left behind or we need to suddenly switch to uh, dealing with intrigue or someone saw shump something they shouldn't or what horror looks like when someone has access to magical powers and someone else doesn't or what does romance look like between someone who's awakened and someone is not. And that brings us to chapter four, which is character creation. Uh, long story short, this is a big section of new skills. This is a big section of new merits and flaws. Uh, it's, I, I don't see a reason to go over that in terrible detail, followed by some play hints on how to build familiars and so on. Chapter five gives us a bunch of new systems, uh, which they simply refer to as noumena. Uh, noumena are any powers that are not necessarily awakened that allow mortals to have access to things they can't normally do 
um, or that appear magical. Within this, you have hedge magic or linear magic, which is the ability to do a certain ritual of a certain type to get a certain effect. It is not nearly as flexible as true magic, but can alter reality in ways that consensus science would have difficulty describing. You have psychic abilities, which come from the mind. And finally, true faith, the uh, the sledgehammer of, of the mage system. It goes through that in great detail with varying degrees of specificity. And finally, we get to chapter six. And oh, Nelly, this is the part where Terry Terry just says, great. We get a whole bunch of acolytes. We get a whole bunch of familiars. And we get a whole bunch of consorts. And this section was well done. The characters are completely fleshed out. You get a thumbnail sketch of what the character looks like, which is also helpful. It draws in a bunch of creatures from a bunch of different lines. We get a, a vampire. We get a werewolf or another member of a changing breed. The familiars are pretty well thought through. I super enjoyed those. And then finally, we get the back cover, the sign that the book is over. And I talked a lot. Adam, where do you want to start? <laughs> well, yeah, but you talked well, and that's, uh, that's more oh, important. Oh, you're kind. Um, <laughs> I share your opinions on some things, uh, thought a little differently on others. To quickly sum up as, as we walk through the sections of the book, uh, yeah, the, the prelude take one is, is two pages of uh, opening fiction for this book, and I thought it was not very well thought out, not very well written. It, it does not inspire me to want to read the book or or to jump into much of anything. And so I, I just feel like that really could have been done better, uh, honestly. As we look at uh, some of the other sections, um, it stands out to me that there are two whole chapters of, of game rules, which um, I'm not used to seeing outside of a core book. But uh, it's it's appropriate. I don't think that's that's uh, bad or good. I think it's just naturally what you're going to find in a book that, that really gets into detail on mortals. I would say that um, a, a helpful rule of thumb when talking about noumena, noumena is supposed to be mortal powers. And, and so uh, j as a, you've got a sphere magic, which is the most flexible and the most powerful. And then you take a step down, you have less flexible and less, less powerful uh, blood magic, like the thaumaturgy of vampires from Vampire the Masquerade. And then if you take another step down, you get hedge magic, sometimes called sorcery as a game term. And that is the noumena of, of giving magic to normal mortals who are not ghouls, they're not vampires, they're not awakened, they're just people who found the right books and worked really hard at it. And so there's, I, I like to think of it as three general power levels of magic in the world of darkness. When it comes to the who's who, chapter six at the very end, um, I thought that was, was also nice. Uh, we do get a lot of uh, concerts, acolytes, and familiars. And what I thought was a little different was at the end of each write-up uh, for, for each signature character, um, it gives a little paragraph of story hints, which um, I don't remember seeing too often in a lot of other World of Darkness books. And, and they basically say, look, uh, here's how you can use this as an NPC. Here's a likely situation where your characters might come into contact with this uh, NPC and how they might react with it. And some of them even give two possibilities there. And so I thought it was it was nice, it was concise, and it was it was appropriate and helpful. So how snarky am I allowed to get on this episode? Are we doing are we doing demi snark, half snark, full snark? You give me some guidelines here, Both. You're the good natured <laughs> one between the two, because I have feelings about this book. Well, um, I'm gonna say this, Terry, you are good at snark, so <laughs> you can go for it. Okay. You will play. I'm the not very good at it, so I have to be careful. Oh man. Are you as jazzed about the fact that obviously everyone who cracks up in this book is gonna be like Yes, I have a Bastet were cat that just follows me around and goes on adventures with me. Because that's super the thing that the book implies. Like, okay, so one phrase the book keeps using is rare. Okay, what does rare mean? Like, rare for a mage? Like, you can bend the laws of reality. You're In early mage, there you were at least as rare as one in a million. So, like, how rare is rare then? Are there more mages than psychics? Are there more psychics than mages? I feel like there should be more psychics running around, but that's just kind of me. But then you're like, oh, there's a lot of psychics running around. Isn't the technocracy going to have a problem with that? Probably! Because the recurring theme of this book to me is it doesn't quite fit together. It needed one more editorial pass, and I feel like that reflects in a lot of places. So it's great. They just had re released the, the try book for the best at. Okay, let's drag them in. Great, it's fine. Sell across different lines. But then they're like, these things are super rare and you'll probably never encounter them. 
Here's a half page on all the different forms. Great. Okay, thanks. And at the same time, they don't mention the Korax at all. Come on, man. The cigar chomping were ravens. That's what Mage needs. Not like sexy cat people. And I don't know why they're always sexy. Why can't you just have a frumpy cat? Per- anyway, that is neither here nor there. <laughs> and it just kind of goes from there. Like the, the Nefandi as they're presented are super stereotypical. Like we get the N word. Like I understand that they wanted to be edgy in the 90s. They go full on N word. And just a whole bunch of other racist terms. And they're like, we're going to hunt people. Okay, we got it. I understand the Nefandi are the bad guy. How do we get a little more subtlety in there rather than like hunting the most dangerous game of all? Man, the interstitial art was nonsensical. Like there would just be an illustration in the middle and it would be like somebody under a tree or a woman with a bird. Like what? what's going on there? And there were a bunch of cases where it would be the same illustration on two subsequent pages, but backwards like page 100 has a guy who very much looks like he's being lynched page 101 very much has a guy looking like he's being lynched like i get it this is a bit much so that's just me and then periodically another quality one that uh somewhere around like page 91 there's just a guy in a coat he's just a big guy in a coat it looks like i i don't know what that image is supposed to give to me again you take all these things out and you get a great 60 page book that terry is super interested in the plot ideas are super well thought out the mage kustos interactions i think are very well thought out the characters are great but like the internal systems just don't make sense to me. So you can give a familiar the ability to eat paradox. For two points, it'll eat one point of paradox a month. For six points, it'll do one a day. So you spend three times as much, you get something that is literally 30 times better. And it's just things like that. Like, And I understand there are storytellers who will be like, oh, I wouldn't give players access to that. I'm a person who says... We're all excited about the game, and every time you say no to a player, they die a little on the inside. And as much as we can avoid doing that, the better. Some of the systems just didn't quite make sense internally, like the fact that unbelief can apply to linear magic. I thought the whole point of linear magic was it isn't affected by paradox, and a manifestation of paradox is unbelief. The hearth lore skill, where it's like, you have folk wisdom. Okay, what is that? What does that actually do? And it gives one or two examples, but the examples they give are more or less the awareness trait which doesn't quite make sense to me. So that was, I guess that's my commentary on on systems. Were there any systems where you're like, oh, this is great. Oh, I guess the one redeeming thing was the hedge magic, the rituals they present and like how hedge magic is actually done, I thought was super compellingly described. The examples they gave for like, here's a flavorful way to cast a curse or here are some enchanted objects you can create. Those were amazing. Like those are better than a lot of the information we get on like focuses in other books and it's just bing bang boom a whole list of them those were amazing super duper great love it <laughs> yeah uh terry and i were, were talking a bit uh before this episode and uh w- one of the really interesting things about uh being able to have uh, two hosts is, is being able to see slightly different points of view and in a lot of areas i, I really do agree with terry and in some of other areas um i i feel differently and i'm not going to say i disagree with terry because i don't actually disagree with him it's just that i i have a different impression and a, and a different feeling about things uh, uh we, we've said many times in the past that i'm a rules light guy and and terry uh, really I'm rules likes heavy. It. Like I want a <laughs> monthly supplement. I w- I want to get Mage Quarterly that that just comes out with a big old fat tome of rules every time. I it comes from fundamental insecurity about my ability to tell a story, and my players will mention that too that I'm bad at it. Adam, on the other hand, is the good storyteller. He doesn't need well, need as many rules. Uh, yeah, uh, and, until we record me running a few people through a session, <laughs> and it's like, uh oh, the secret's out. But but anyways, putting that aside. For- I do uh, consider myself to be a rules light guy, and that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. It doesn't make you a better or worse storyteller. It's, it's just my style and my outlook on things. But when I look at the systems presented in Ascension's right hand, I don't have as much of a problem uh, with a lot of the things uh, listed in here. Um, as I've said before, um, when I get to the merits and flaws in here, when I get to the special advantages section, which honestly is superpowers, you know, well, yeah, let's let's kind of yeah. call it what it is here it's 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 special advantages we just call it superpowers but uh, when i get to that i see uh like someone opens up a big toolbox and it's full of tools and some of those tools are going to be great and some of those tools are going to be terrible and i think a, a storyteller needs to look into that toolbox and say yeah that one's going to work for me and that one's not going to work for me and this one i'm not even sure i, I just want to put it into my game and, and 
play around with it and see where it takes me. And maybe it's going to suck. Maybe it's going to be awesome. To run with your analogy, it's like buying my first toolbox. And instead of having a regular sized hammer, it has a jeweler's hammer and a sledgehammer. And you're like, well, why didn't they give me something in between? And that's that's what it felt like to me. So as someone who who likes the rules, I want the rules there to be internally consistent and I want them to all make sense together. So it is fine to say like, oh, I'm not going to have these, but if you're like me and you want to have those things, you want them to play together well. And I super don't feel like that 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 happened. Yeah. Whereas I I liked the uh, the special advantages or the you know the powers and and the merits and flaws and a large number of numina. Uh, I I like that because uh, one of the things I like about Mage is that this is a game that encourages storytellers and players to look at the Mage setting as being you know wide open. You you can do anything here. You can take this anywhere if if you want to make up a new class of supernatural touched mortals that have a certain class of powers it's like you can use this as a sort of uh, tool set to build out that addition to the world of darkness that you want to have in your mage games this gives me some of the tools to start building out that stuff and you know rules like guys like me like to be able to do that and i do I, i really do understand people who have more of terry's approach where it's like look i'm buying a game book so that this stuff can be worked out and I can be given tools that are appropriate to use for my campaign. So, yeah, I, that's a totally legitimate and understandable point of view. And I'm glad that Terry brings that to the discussion. And uh, I'm just, you know, I, I just like to be able to, to say that, you know, some, some of us are rules like guys and we like to be able to just open up the toolbox and say, gosh, look at all this stuff. What could I do with that? What could I do with that? Um, when Terry says the book was poorly edited, um, <laughs> In some ways, uh, there are things that I see as open-ended and interesting, and he sees as uh, could be could might have been poorly edited here. And there are other things that were just clearly poorly edited. Who's hooks? <laughs> yeah, Terry's referring to chapter six, where if you look down at the bottom of the right-hand pages, it says chapter six. It's supposed to say who's who because that's the name of the chapter. Instead, it says who's hawks or who's hooks. There's an X it's, it's at the end of who. On page after page after page. It's like uh-huh. okay. Guys, you know, come on. And another thing that is even worse is when you go to the merits and flaws section, there are three merits that they make available to you. Uh, they are fairy companion, three point, shape changer kin, four point, uh, ghoul, uh, five point. And those who are you know familiar with the other games in the world of darkness know more about that. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going into it. But it's basically, you know, it's, it's a little boost to your character. It's worth some merit points, but it's, it's not you know totally chronicle wrecking. But what they do is they say fairy companion, three point, and they give you the first paragraph. And then it skips to the last paragraph of ghoul, Five point merit, and this and it's like, okay, half of fairy companion isn't here, half of ghoul isn't here, shape changer kin isn't here at all, and then the next book that was published in the, the mage line was halls of the arcanum, and you go to the very end of the book and they say hidden lore uncovered. Ooh, that's cool. What is it? Oh, it's the errata from Ascension's right hand. Uh, thanks, guys. Great. <laughs> so the thing that's almost impressive about that is, so I read from the PDF generally, and. Even in the PDF copy, like that fix is not in there. You figure drive through <laughs> RPG would just be like, oh, here's the fix. And, and even the pages are out of order. Like if you crack open a book and the left hand page is an odd number, that's a sign that something kind of went wrong in the Western world in general. The right page starts with page one. Uh, this case, the odd page is on the left. And on page 78 and 79, the art is so thoroughly phoned in that it is uh, so 78 depicts a uh, generic person with glasses with a thing in their hand 79 is the color inverse of that where black is white and white is black and it's swapped left to right how can you tell it's swapped left to right literally because in the page 78 version the artist's signature is even backwards they didn't even bother to fill that in (laughs) Uh, yeah, ter- Terry's uh, Terry's comments on the artwork are, are valid. I didn't feel as strongly uh, about it as he did, but yeah, he, what he's saying is... How about the illustration on page 77 where a guy is obviously being kicked in the nards by an imp? Uh, <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, okay, That's yeah like, that is not oh, the my best nads. picture. Yeah, one thing about the artwork that I wanted to say is as as I was flipping through this book, there are a number of images of people being physically abused with hints of sexual overtones here. And it's like, I don't think it's an overtone. (laughs) (laughs) Some of them are pretty darn obvious. There's a woman who is being very visibly mistreated. And I don't even want to go into a lot of detail here because it's not 
that great an image to really discuss with with uh, the general public. But yeah, I, after flipping through this book, it's like, okay, what is it about physically abusing women here? I, but I mean, even though I'm not a very political guy, it, it stands out here. It's like, oh yeah. What? What? Yeah, you mentioned in here that Nafandi treat uh, often treat their acolytes and their consorts really, really badly, and it's like, okay, I get that it makes sense, but why do we need this many pictures depicting it? it, it uh -huh. I'm starting to think that it. it I mean, I, I've got a wife and kids in the house, and they're going to come to the shelf and pull this off the shelf and say, "What's this about, Daddy?" I'm like, um, you know what? That's not mine. <laughs> Read Gods and Monsters. <laughs> you know the co-host that the dad said he was going to spend less time talking to? It's his. The other recurring theme is almost all the men have long hair, and those who don't have long hair have hats. There is certainly some artistic <laughs> themes that show up in here. There's a lot of people being hit with beams and broad-chested men with short hair. It's... I don't know. Was it just rejected art from other books that they're all like, they just <laughs> emptied the folder and shook it. And like, it's not sexually suggestive. It's like, it's a little bit porny. It's like using like it, the it, N word and saying that the term is racially charged. Like we, we got a little bit of understatement going on here. Yeah. So yeah, the artwork is, yeah, you look through it and it's like, okay, so we, we said what we think about the artwork here, and we, and we don't think that differently about it. So moving on, there were some areas where uh, Terry, Terry thought it, it was like inconsistent or, or didn't hold together too well. And I think he has a legitimate point. Uh, we are reading a lot of mage books, you know, most of, or almost all of uh, first edition up to this point, we mostly get examples of mages uh, living on their own, operating on their own, or perhaps uh, in cooperation with a few other awakened mages. And uh, we don't have a whole lot of examples of uh, acolytes or consorts hanging out with majors or, or you know, uh, doing their laundry for them, et cetera. And here in this book, the book is on that topic. And so, of course, it's, it's just totally full of that. And so a person reading through this book could get the impression that, oh, the world of mage doesn't have a, a lot of acolytes. And now somebody opened the floodgates and every two-bit mage has two acolytes following him around. And uh, I... I I totally understand how someone can get that impression reading through this book, but in my mind, this is the book that focuses on that topic, and so that was not so out of place, uh, you know, in in my mind. The thing to me is, I very rarely have players that take allies. And I feel like even in a book on allies, it kind of overrepresents them. Like one of the problems I have is, so I take three dots and allies or four dots and allies, and that tells me the power of the ally and they kind of tool around. And assuming I don't tell them to do anything too suicidal, they'll probably do what I say as long as it fits with their agenda. But in the case where like they're a live-in person at a Chantry, like who's paying them? Do I also need the resources background to pay that? Like those, those are the kind of things that got a little bit messy for me like it kind of suggests that in a lot of places that mages are rich but very few of the pre-made characters we get have any dots and resources so is it suggesting that consorts and acolytes only attach themselves to higher level mages and i feel like it's one of those things where the the allies background they, they don't really bang on about it they they specifically say like backgrounds can't be increased with experience points but a little more information to be like yo, this is how you can accumulate one. I can totally get that. Like, I think every mage troop has kind of picked up a mortal, if nothing else, kind of as their mascot. Um, I, it, we don't necessarily need the acolyte or consort term, but mortals will eventually get swept up in your activities and to make them part of the ongoing chronicle, I kind of like. But this game kind of starts with the they're already there. Um, and I would have liked a little bit more on this is how it can be introduced into an existing chronicle. That's, that's just me. Yeah, and, and I was not as bothered by this because, the, it, as the book mentions, there are some acolytes who attach themselves to a mage and they are not paid. It, it's just out of love or thrill-seeking or you know, all these other different psychological or, or personal reasons. And so I was not bothered as much by that. I, I actually like the fact that the book encourages people who, you know, it encourages mage fans to see mage, the ascension, as not just uh, mages who can do magic and their conflicts and their societies, but it encourages all of us to look at mage, the ascension, as more of a complete setting. Mage, to me, is not just um, rotes and spheres and mages. It is also this larger world that mages are a part of. It is the umbra. It is oracles. It is chantries, it is acolytes, it is uh, familiars and seekings and, and all these other things that, that make it more of a rich environment, in, in my mind at least. And so I like how the book kind of 
it helps draw you into that. Oh yeah, and there are four things this book does super well that if I hadn't read it, I, I would have skipped. So just the context for me screaming a lot. Are you familiar with the term, Adam, uh, the bitch-eating crackers effect? <laughs> Um, I, until recently I was not, but, uh, you, you helped me understand that, that little bite of wisdom. So, so the idea is you, uh, it is possible to dislike something so that everything it does, you kind of don't like, even if under normal circumstances, you'd be fine with it. So in a good book, a lot of these errors, I would just sleep under the rug, but because like of my slight inclination against it. I, I tend to have disdain for it. It's the opposite of the halo effect where you yeah. have. And, and I, I'm guilty of the halo <laughs> effect here. The halo effect is where. Uh, Bill the, the Bridges person... writes anything. Uh... <laughs> guilty. <Okay. laughs> but, but granted, the halo effect is where the person you're focusing on is so great that, that they can do no wrong. Everything yeah. they say is brilliant because they said it. Or the topic of the book is, is such a favorite topic of yours that the book can do no wrong. And I might be guilty of that when we get to the Umbra book later in second edition. But for now, um, I may be guilty of that when looking at Ascension's right hand because I was so pleased to bring in the topic of familiars at acolytes and concerts. I, I enjoy looking at that slice of the the uh, awakened world. And so I was in a mindset where I was more willing to forgive some of the faults of the book because I just enjoy the topic so much. But again, honestly, even though I sound like I'm disagreeing with Terry, I really don't because he does bring up a lot of valid points and it kind of boils down to a to, to a point of view in some cases. So these are the four things that I think the book does super well in terms of what adding a kustos can do to your game. One, it humanizes the mage. If it's mages talking about mage things all the mage time, you kind of ignore the normal human drives for maybe vengeance, relationships, love, family, and other things that are way easier to express with the non-awakened, but still the people close by. And consors are a way to give those people a voice. Acolytes are a way of giving those people a voice. And that's great. Two, they give context to the Ascension War. They give a mortal's perspective of what is at stake. The third thing it does is it gives you a reference power level that your characters will be familiar with. Like, hey, we know what we can do with Forces 3 Prime 2. This is what our Kustos can do with a shotgun. And that is that is super useful as a reference. And the fourth thing, fourth thing is it allows for like what I'm going to call diet crossovers where you can introduce a night folk of another line easily in a light way by having fairy contacts or having a bastet that you can occasionally get a f favor from, where you've established the reason why the characters are going to be working together with this other entity as part of the backstory, and you can bring it in where it's appropriate. And I think those are kind of the four great things that you get from introducing this into your chronicle. Yeah, and, and I really want to uh, back up that point about humanizing mages, uh, bringing the, the acolytes in, whether they are player characters or NPCs, either way, it helps mages to kind of, you know, break out of their regular groove and start thinking differently. And it's like, oh, I've been looking at things just from the awakened point of view, and I kind of forgot about the mortal point of view. And having this NPC or this other player in here helps me remember what I was like before I was awakened, and I, and I can sort of see this differently. And, and, and it's nice to be able to bring, for a storyteller to be able to bring those elements into a chronicle because it, it can add a lot to it. Now, uh, one thing I want to mention is if you are playing a first or second edition Chronicle of Mage, uh, I think this book has a lot to offer. But when, if you want to bring this book in, you are going to get a very nice benefit from also bringing in two other books that were also hovering around the uh, second edition time of Mage. Uh, first off is World of Darkness Sorcerer. Now in Ascension's right hand, there's a chapter on Numina and we get a lot of uh, hedge magic. Some people call it path magic. It's it's mortal, weaker kinds of uh, magic and, and spell abilities. And if you get uh, World of Darkness Sorcerer, you get a lot more of those. You get whole new areas that are not mentioned in Ascension's right hand. And if you like that stuff, it, it, it's really fun. It's great. And there's no conversion of rules necessary at all. Also, there was a book put out under the World of Darkness uh, imprint, which was supposed to be a source book for Vampire, the Masquerade Dark Ages, and at the same time, a source book for Mage Sorcerer's Crusade, which was Renaissance era Mage, which was a second edition rule set. And so Bygone Bestiary, even though it is World of Darkness and there's no Mage logo on it, it is um, a great source of information for Mage. 
making more uh, weird creatures more familiars, um, the what is it, special advantages, which I, I called superpowers. There's a lot more in there, and so it is just natural to bring that in when you're using Ascension's right hand. But but even as I record this right now, I, I can already hear the guy in the back objecting, saying, hey, what about me? I'm not playing the first or second edition. I'm playing uh, Mage 20, or I'm playing Revised. Uh, well, two things uh, I would like to mention to, to those uh, Mage fans. Uh, first off is if you're playing Revised or Mage 20, then you're probably going to want to reach for Gods and Monsters, which, uh, as this is being recorded in the middle of uh, 2019, has already been published. It is available. It's over 200 pages in PDF or book form. It offers uh, everything you're going to want uh, for your Chronicle uh, at the Revised and Mage 20 rule set for uh, familiars, custos, um, acolytes, uh, strange creatures that you want to create or just pull out of a sort of mini monster manual and add to your game. So uh, Mage has you covered there. Also, if you want to take Ascension's right hand and just use it in Mage 20, uh, you'll need to do a little bit of rules conversion, but honestly, not that much. Um, it, it is still useful to you, and I still think has uh, some benefit for you. So either way, I think there's a lot of material that's going to help your Chronicle. And if I could just uh, stick on the uh, topic of concerts for a moment, uh, there are uh, two things that, that I wanted to, to mention about that. When this book was published, they, they don't mention it. They may not have even realized it, but it, it seems there are two different power levels of consors in Mage the Ascension. And uh, first off, if you take the uh, rules for Vampire the Masquerade or Werewolf the Apocalypse and make a werewolf or a vampire player character and then uh, pull it into a mage game as a consor then that uh, vampire or werewolf character is going to be ability and power level roughly equivalent to a mage. Uh, if you instead decide to make a player character consort out of Ascension's right hand, uh, you can certainly do that, but uh, it is going to be in the mortal tier. It's going to be less powerful, less able than a mage. And uh, that's something that they don't really call out in this book. I think it would have been nice to at least you know, mention that. Uh, what I do, and they do not mention in this book, is I offer an, e uh, an equal strength option. In the past, when I've had uh, groups of uh, players going through mage, I just said to them, hey, if you want to make a consort out of Ascension's right hand, I'm going to let you use material out of Bygone Bestiary and World of Darkness Sorcerer. I'm going to let you have a, a power level roughly equivalent to a mage. Uh, you can have the same uh, number of dots and abilities, the same number of dots to spend among the skills, and uh, perhaps a bit more in uh, freebie points. And uh, I think that equal power option is something this book does not mention, and I think it is worth offering to characters if they want to be a consort alongside of mages. Uh, if I could circle back for a moment. To... Circle back. <laughs> uh, Terry mentioned the uh, sidebar uh, earlier in the book about uh, Bastet, which yeah. are basically... Yeah, cats. Were cats. They are uh, were tigers, were lions, were panthers, and, and some other great cats. Certainly not uh, domestic cats uh, that we know of. Oh, man, that would be amazing if they had those. Like the weakest of the Bastet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like warehouse cats. I could get behind that. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was uh, reading through the sidebar on Bastet, I, I actually really liked that because of all of the were creatures that you could pull into a mage game as a consort, uh, I, I think a lot of them could give interesting options. And I agree with Terry. I think Korax uh, could make some cool consorts in there. But uh, getting back to Bastet, I think they work well as a were creature consort for a mage game because they are more likely to be curious about and uh, able to get along with mages and, and more willing to compromise a bit and live with some regular humans and, and kind of break out of their uh, regular circle of being with other uh, were creatures and warriors of Gaia. Also, Bastet are more likely to be able to keep a secret even from their own kind, uh, they're less likely to, to just blab to the other were creatures. Hey, guess what I learned from all those mages? Bastet are more likely to actually, you know, think that they are cool for knowing these secrets and keeping these secrets away from other were creatures. So I, I like that it mentions them. And of course, when it mentions them, it has to clarify that um, even though Bastets would make really cool consorts in a game of mage, not every Chantry has one. Not every mage has a Bastet buddy following him around. Uh, it, it can be 
a difficult thing to add to a chronicle. My rule of thumb is if there is a player character behind this consort or even familiar, then yeah, make it powerful. Let it have more powers and abilities and stuff it can do. Let it be more a part of uh, each game session. If it is an NPC that is purchased through the allies background for a mage character, then I have it appear in the game less, perhaps be a little a bit less knowledgeable, a bit less powerful. They can uh, overbalance a game if you just throw a wear creature into one. Well, I mean, I, to me, the super thing is, one, they can't fly, so they don't have that extra direction in which to escape that has an annoying way of destroying plots, and they also can't really step sideways in the same way. So once again, like, a werewolf is outmatched, and he's like, peace! Which, I mean, if your werewolf is outmatched as your consort, then, like, your mages are, t- are, are, are thoroughly hosed. Uh, two, a best that you can still kill with a shotgun, which is nice. Like, you want killable consorts. That made me sound much more maniacal than I was going for. But still, and Terry, also... The truth comes out. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it, this, is, this is secretly informed by the fact that Cats as a musical is going to appear as a movie in time for Christmas. And that's, that's still throwing me off. Oh gosh, um, I didn't even know that. Now that I hear it, it started. Oh, you to didn't know off. that, and but I think it I think... started to throw me off now. But, but yeah, getting back to your point, uh, yeah, I, I should have mentioned that. Uh, generally speaking, when looking at were creatures in the world of darkness, best at have a harder time stepping sideways into the umbra than werewolves do, and they are generally less physically powerful than werewolves are. And so, yeah, that again, it makes them consorts that are easier to add to mage games than uh, a number of the other were creatures. So I liked having a sidebar on them. I thought it was kind of cool to to get those wheels turning. I wanted to throw in an anecdote from my own uh, gaming experience in the past. I had a time uh, some years back where I was running a a very long-running online chronicle for Mage. I was focusing on Mage. It was not about crossovers. And an offline friend of mine who I knew quite well approached me and said, hey – I want to I want to join your online game and and be one of the players but I want to play a werewolf and I thought oh I don't think that's a good idea. I think that could really imbalance things and really uh, throw a monkey wrench in the works. And so I tried to talk her out of it. And she said, no, I, you know, come on, give me a chance. I really want to do this. And I said, okay, fine. I went to the other mage players who were regulars. They were coming you know, every every Thursday night. And I said, look, I, I've got a friend who wants to come in as a werewolf and just join it. And it's like, what do you guys think of that? And they said, hey, cool. We think it's fun. Well, you know, let her do it. And I was like, seriously, you want a werewolf running around? Because they're like this and like that. And they're like, yeah, do it. And so I went back to the player and I said, okay, uh, this is a mage game. We are focusing on mage themes and, and mage things. But if you want to have a werewolf in a mage world, you can do that. And I thought it was going to be a mess. I was wrong. Um, the player did a great job. Uh, the, the werewolf uh, joined the cabal and said, look, I'm, I'm going to be the muscle and I'll, I'll follow your direction. And the mages thought that <laughs> they had, had found the secret to uh, to gamer power. They said, oh, we've got a pocket werewolf that we can direct any way we want. We think this is the coolest thing since sliced bread. And it, it actually worked out really well. Whenever there was a physical threat to the player's uh, cabal, then the werewolf character said, this is my job. I'm going to jump right into it, uh, you know, f- fists swinging. And the players thought that was great. It's like, hey, we've got a secret weapon. We can direct at our enemies. And so I started putting in more physically powerful NPCs for the werewolf to deal with. But everybody was having fun. It was working out great. We ran for a couple of months that way. And then finally, you know, my friend playing the werewolf said, look, I, I got to go now. And she ducked out. But and then I everyone was died because of all the enemies that they had racked up and no, had I had no world to protect them. Hurry, but I was just <laughs> so surprised. I thought it was going to totally throw things off and be a mess that I had to clean up. And actually, it was a lot of fun. Everybody was happy and it worked great. So sometimes even I can be open-minded and it can work out. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Sometimes even I can be open-minded. Adam Simpson. I go wildly back and forth on Mixed Chronicles. I'm a huge fan of other Night Focus NPCs, but not necessarily other Night Focus players. Did it bother you that they referred to vampires as Awakened, capital A, throughout this book? That was infuriating. Bitch eating crackers. It wasn't actually... I'm sorry. (laughs) That's fine. (laughs) Okay, you're accusing me of of falling into the halo effect, but I will say this. No, you're not. Like, let me fully explain. So the idea of the bitch eating crackers (laughs) effect is the idea that you hate someone so much that just them looking, eating crackers angers you because you're like, look at that bitch eating crackers. So that's (laughs) just to explain that. I'll have to cut that back into the appropriate section. But like, it was just like, Okay, I was not bothered by it because I am accustomed to an adult. 
and you can deal with no, these things. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I wish that was true, but uh, <laughs> no, um, I wish I was mature. But but no, actually, the reason I was not bothered by that was because I have grown accustomed over time to seeing the term awakened with a capital A applied in two different ways. And it, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but I am used to it. Yeah. Uh, the first is awakened is a, a mage who can uh, is awakened to magic and can learn and use sphere magic. And that is the proper use of the term. An improper use of the term that snuck in again and again in the first two editions of Mage was an awakened anybody is someone who will not incur paradox when they see um, vulgar magic in front of their eyes because they are an active part of the supernatural world. And that is, if you show vulgar magic to a vampire, they're going to be surprised, but not in the same way that a sleeper is surprised because they know that there are mysterious, strange things in the night, and they know that there are people, there are vampires out there that can do strange, crazy magic. And when they see a mage doing strange, crazy magic, it's, again, it's surprising, but it's not totally f unbelievable to them. Yeah, I'm not encouraging it, but Awakened with a capital A being someone who is not surprised by magic, it, it shows up again and again in mage books, and I'm used to it. And that is one problem with acolytes. Some acolytes do not count as Awakened, and if you do vulgar magic in front of them, all the paradox falls on the mage uh, who, who's using the effect. Other times, uh, you've got acolytes who do count as awakened, and when they see a mage do magic, it's like, oh yeah, I totally know all about that, and the paradox does not fall on the mage. And so, um, I hate to make it sound like mage is a difficult game, I don't think it really is, but mage storytellers need to be away, aware that some acolytes count as awakened, some acolytes do not count as awakened. Yeah, you're right, 700 page rule book, so bang it out in a weekend. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our entire podcast is, is like completely predicated on the complexity of this game. <laughs> so, but we're working on that. We, 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 we are working on that. We are working on that. Secret plans for M5. You heard it here first. If nothing else, consider it a compliment to the current and recent editors of the Mage the Ascension line that I can't remember the last time with one or two exceptions that I have pointed at something and said, this is a travesty in terms of book publishing. So I am glad we are out of that era now. I wanted to bring up the section in, uh, I believe it's towards the back of chapter two, where we get the fellowships. I really like that they give fellowships. Again, I like to see that larger uh, world of Mage the Ascension. And I, I think it's appropriate and interesting that you have these fellowships. But when I read through these couple of pages of fellowships, I see a lot of obvious choices. I see a lot of um, things that are kind of interesting, but not terribly interesting. And so uh, for those of you who are working uh, fellowships of, of acolytes and just acolytes and concerts in general into your games, I say, don't overlook the, the interesting possibilities of these fellowships. Make up your own, add your own. You can even look through the Numina section and you can look at the, the uh, psionic uh, mind powers or the different hedge magic paths and say, I, I could build one or more uh, fellowship of acolytes even around this. Uh, I really like that dynamic and how acolytes from one chantry might travel with a mage to a different chantry and then you know get, uh, network with the other acolytes there and find out that there's a fellowship oh i can join this or we can start something or we can have regular messages going back and forth I, I just think that's such a cool part of mage and one thing that i did in my chronicles which may appeal to some and not so much to others is i really like to get into that shadow society the the kustos society of the um council of nine mystic traditions when talking about the council of nine mystic traditions just just to be brief here some people really like to have a, a, a coherent structured council of nine where they there are uh, chantries that um, you know represent the different traditions. The, the the Council of Nine has meetings. They have representatives. They send diplomats to different places. It, it's it's a working group. Other people like to lean more towards uh, what was happening more in the revised edition of Mage, where the Council of Nine Mystic Traditions was less coherent. It was less formal, uh, less active, uh, more more you know fragmentary, broken up, and, and more of an idea than a practicality. But in my chronicles, I said that there were uh, groups of, uh, of acolytes and, and even consors who had been living in chantries for generations and had their own subcultures that, where they did not live on Earth, or if they did live on Earth, they lived very much up 
apart from regular sleeper society. They were very much aware of what the Council of Nine was doing. The Euthanatos acolytes were, were really into what the Euthanatos were doing, and the Hermetic acolytes were really into what the Hermetics were doing. And one of the benefits of being a member of uh, the Council of Nine, uh, of the traditions, is that if you establish a new chantry and a new horizon realm, uh, one of the things you're going to say is, hey, we're going to need a lot of, of people helping us out. We're going to need a lot of acolytes. And so you can actually go to another tradition chantry and say, look, I'm officially representing this new horizon realm, this new chantry. Uh, we need a group of kustos, a group of acolytes to, to come and, and live at our chantry and, and, and you know help us out. And this is what I'm offering. And this is what makes uh, living at this chantry so great. So, you know, please, uh, you society of acolytes have been doing this for generations and, and don't want to mix with regular sleepers and, and fear the technocracy as much as we do. Uh, I'm recruiting. Do you want to send 10, 20, 30 of your guys over to, to establish a new uh, uh, chapter of acolytes? Or is my deal not sweet enough and I need to make it sweeter for you? You can actually have some, some dickering there. I, I like having yeah. that. I don't but know. It, in my head, there's a good chance that the acolytes get traded around like for a pack of cigarettes in a prison or something like that. It's <laughs> one of those things where it, it, it does very quickly bring up some uncomfortable questions that I'm not entirely comfortable dealing with as a storyteller. But I do like your idea of essentially treating acolyte families almost like revenant families in vampires. So generate uh, yeah. families that have been ghouled to the point where they produce their own vitae. But in this case, uh, without all the ghoul parts to it i've you know in my own time i've i've visited different true subcultures where because of different philosophies or religions that there's a coherent group that's been going for a couple of generations and they're glad that they live apart from general society and whether that's good or bad you know it depends entirely on the group and what they're doing some of these subcultures are very healthy some not as healthy but yeah. i i just think it's an interesting idea where you've got a group of acolytes who say yeah we stand with the traditions because we know that the technocracy is bad and we're gl we're glad we don't live in modern day chicago because then the syndicate and the new world order would be pushing us around and we're glad we're not getting pushed around yeah when you say like subcultures that have persisted for generations in my head i immediately think of like people who really like the programming language pearl but yeah i i, <laughs> I see what you mean there or yeah, it's something that maybe more monastic. This goes in the big old bucket of things that Terry doesn't usually include in his chronicles because, like, it's just another thing to keep track of. And I am perfectly fine with acolytes and so on, like, as a cutaway, as a lead-in, as okay, this session we're gonna be we're gonna be mortals, and it's going to fit into the greater story. That is strictly personal preference. I, I do think things in general were improved in M20. The systems were kind of aligned to make more sense. You don't have the problem where, like, for 15 points, your character is more or less unkillable. That's a bit. Uh, uh, that's a bit that's a bit jacked in terms of powers yeah and uh i think that's i think that's gone through largely my my, my commentary on it but at the end of the day mage chronicles volume two was like eight bucks there's 60 good pages in this book as long as you like go through and you put masking tape over all the art uh and tear out that introductory <laughs> section you're great and like if you're like me and you just read the introductory section you're like to love god i, I may have to go back and re-edit that but i mean man that was a flashback for me <laughs> yeah, I, I remember the song, but I guess it, it was not as big a part of my life as it was for you. But yeah, in some mage books, you read the quotes and it's like, oh, wow, that, that is so cool. I, I love to just hang on to that quote for a second. And in other mage books, it's like, yeah, OK, you like these bands. Great. Can we, yeah. can we get to good, good <laughs> stuff? You used a, a random song lyric generator to deal with this because you were like 30, 30 words <laughs> under your word count. That's uh, Ascension's right hand. I think there's uh, some good material in here. And uh, I like the, the open toolbox toolbox nature of the merits and flaws and the special advantages uh, and for other people I can see how they could be problematic but uh, I encourage that, you to take a look at it that's what it is it's it's a toolbox at a yard sale where you're <laughs> like where you're like yeah you've got 17 nearly identical screwdrivers and like like do you have any Phillips heads I just need one Phillips head and that that is Ascension's right hand yeah, I keep talking about toolboxes, and it's because I, I have a lot of toolboxes in my garage, and it's like my mind keeps going there. But uh, that that's just me. I hope that's my fine. listeners are more healthily adjusted than I am. I would mispluralize it and call them tools box, but I'm, I'm one of the people that likes mispluralizing things. Did I ever tell you the story of Roots Canal? I should do that sometime. We will, If we ever do a Patreon with the deleted content, I will add that in there. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Honestly, that about wraps it up for me. I think we've covered the book. I think we've uh, covered how you can use it, uh, what you can find there, and what to watch out for. 
not every book is solid gold, but this has enough gold in it that I think it's it's worth picking up and thumbing through, certainly. So uh, I, I guess, uh, are we ready to lead out there, Terry? I think we're ready to lead out here there, boss. <laughs> well, uh, I just encourage you to contact us at magethepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, let us know what you think, positive or negative. If you have any questions that you would like to be read on an episode and you would like us to discuss, you can send them to that email address and uh, we'll do what we can for you. Also, you can subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and uh, several other places. We've got a good presence on the Anchor app. And we encourage you to listen to us there. We've also got the Twitter. You can go to at Mage the Podcast. We're rather active there, especially our producer, Joseph Aleo, has got a lot of great material he's adding on Twitter that's worth a look. And this episode of Mage the Podcast was executively produced by Richard Bat Brewster and Ira Grace. If you'd like to become an executive producer and help support the podcast, click the link on today's show's note, show notes at our website, ah, gotcha. magethepodcast.com. And I think that about sums it up. So until next time, truth until paradox. Just remember, this book contains the N-word. Bye.